your work gets heard, and sometimes if no one else is going to do it, you're going to have to do it yourself. Um, or Davina Lopez often tells us how uh, Real Women Have Curved by, has been produced over a hundred times all over the United States yes. if they would have produced her here in Los Angeles. Wow. So she had to do it. And trailblazing that we have the absolutely fabulous Oralis Nani. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me in your program. Yes. It's exciting to lounge something like this. Uh, Latino, Latina experience, yes. artist. So and you're here, here, here because that is, a, that is exactly what you are, a Latina artist who is moving and shaking the art world. Yes, I've been doing it for a while, and I've learned a lot in the process, and I just keep growing as an artist. And as I grow, I rewrite my plays, mm -hmm. which is what I've done with this play that we're producing right now at Casa 0101, because Casa has become our new home, mm -hmm. Arte Theater Company. This is our fourth production here. And I love it. I love the community. I love the space. I love the people that I work with. And it just feels wonderful to be here. And I've seen all three of your plays here. I haven't seen this fourth one, but I'm really excited. I think I'm coming this weekend. I think this one is not ticket. But I gotta make sure I get tickets because the last three, it was hard for me to get tickets because oh, yeah, they would sell out. Yes. So it's very important that you get your tickets. And where are tickets available for this uh, production? There, you can go straight to machatheater.org. You can get tickets there, or you can go directly to Eventbrite and just say Garbo's Cuban Lover. Get your tickets there. Wonderful. So before we get into the nitty gritty of this particular show, I want, you, I want, I want to hear about Odalis. Oh, uh, you, we were talking a little bit, and um, I, I didn't know that you, you know, were raised in Brooklyn. And yes. for a few years, and then New Jersey, and then your journey out here to, to California. So let's start there. Let's start at the beginning. Oh, like goodness. David Copperfield. Let's start well, I'm, I was young. I'm Cuban American, uh -huh. and my father, my parents filed for asylum in the United States when we were from Fidel Castro, you know, the revolution. And I got here when I was 10, uh, and we landed in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. New York, mm -hmm. which is very different from the island of Cuba. Yes. You know, very different. It was shocking. But, you know, uh, they sacrificed a lot to give us a better life, and my father loved movies. In fact, when we were in Havana, I would go with him to the big movie theaters in wow. Havana. And he would know everything about the movies and the actors and their gossips mm -hmm. and their secrets, and I found it fascinating. Wow. So when I got here to Brooklyn, he allowed me to watch movies late at night, uh, and I would watch all these silent films. And of course, Greta Garbo was one of the main of you know, actresses. Yeah. Osanian film. So, yeah, that's how I was introduced to Greta Garbo. And I think, you know, as a young kid, I kind of fell in love with her mm. in a way. You know, I admire her. I'm sorry about that. Which it's like theater. Turned this off. <laughs> <laughs> no, none of this is happening. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so, that's how I started being excited about, you know, movies and stories. And then as I grew up, I went to college and I discovered live theater. Um, it was this Dr. Vern Smith, he was a professor, he taught live theater, and I joined his class, and we would go to off-off-Broadway shows mm -hmm. and watch them and do a report about the costumes and the lights and the carriage and the story, and I was, I was always getting an A+, plus. and then one day he was doing a show, auditions, and I decided to audition for him. And I did such a good job, I guess, because I was able to, you know, uh, cry for the role, and I had never done this before. It was like an epiphany. Can you cry right now? Oh, I can cry this <laughs> time. <laughs> but, um, so I regressed. So he took me to his office, sat me down, and he said, I think you have a gift. Mm. I think you should really look into acting. And I was like, that meant change my whole life. Wow. Because I was taking political science. <laughs> From political science to acting. Yeah. So wow. That changed my life, really, he did. You know, I'll never forget that. There, there's always that one person that, like, especially as a young person, that influences yes. you, that encourages you, that pushes you to, to do that something that you didn't think you could do. You know what it is when they recognize, when they see something in you and they say, you know, you, I think you have the gift to do this, you should really pursue it. And when you hear those words, that gives you that motivation to really do it. And I did it. I, I, I heard him and I listened and I went ahead and, and followed through. Wonderful. What was the first play you wrote? Oh my goodness, the first play I wrote, well first, interesting enough, I wrote a short film. Mm. It's called Only One Suitcase. And okay. what I did, it was only 25 pages. Mm -hmm. 
and I send it into Sundance Lab. And mm -hmm. then they wrote me a letter back, this was a long time ago, saying, oh, we would like to read the screenplay, the entire screenplay. Well, I didn't have a screenplay, I had a little 25 pages. So I took off from work and I wrote it in a month, a whole 120 pages, and I sent it in and it became one of the seven finalists. Never wow. made it to the finals, but that itself told me something. It taught me that I must be good in writing uh -huh. because they recognized and wanted to read more. So that kind of that's how I started writing. So the first play, that was my first short film, which I also filmed and produced, mm -hmm. only one suitcase, and it's a beautiful story. But the the first play that I wrote, it was called Love Struck. Mm -hmm. And it was a romantic comedy, you know, the up and down of a relationship with these two ladies, okay. two women. And I co wrote it with Marie Barrientos. That was my first play. And then from there, it was such a huge hit that I decided uh, to do an adaptation of a classic play called Blood Wedding. Okay. So I took the play, which was set in 1933, I believe, and I took it from there, and I put it in California in the 1890s, ah. Rancho Days. Okay. So it was very colorful, it was very beautiful. And then what I did, it, I did cost casting. Mm. So there was a maid, female maid, right? And I cast this um, <laughs> Pete Leal, mm. who was a wonderful actor, and he dressed like a like a girl, mm. right? When he gave his mustache, oh. it was very funny. Okay. And then I play Leonardo, uh -huh. which is a, a woman dressed as a man, mm. and it was really great. We got Critics' Choice and Backstage West. We we got really wonderful reviews. Uh, it was a great experience, and from there on, after that, I wrote this play, what? God Was Given Lover. And I've written 10 plays, you know, mm. total 10. I, I wrote God Was Given Lover, then after that I did Skin of Honey, well, it's 2007, then after that I did Love and the Love, I did Beyond Love, uh, I did uh, um, Naked in the Tropics. <coughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> that was about immigration. Okay. And then I did Frida, Stroke of yes. Passion. I've seen and, that one. Yes, and then, you know, God Was Given Lover, of course. Um, yeah, so we, I have three plays that have been published on Amazon. Wow. Uh, that is God Was Given Lover, Skin of Honey, and uh, Frida Struff of Passion. You know what I find so fascinating and interesting is that from the get-go you were writing queer content. You were writing about lesbian love, <laughs> which is something that you know often isn't credited to, to Latina writers. No. But, it's, but it is you. And that's what you've written. You know, it reminds me of... You know, I came out through my writing. Wow. Yeah. Because when I did Love Struck, you know, back in 1997, um, everybody was in the closet. Mm -hmm. Nobody, you know, especially if you're an actress, it was not a good thing to come out. Mm -hmm. But what happened was, um, you know, it was a packed house, and, you know, I got off the stage, and they wanted to talk to me, and this young man, very attractive young, approached me, and he said to me, you know, this place is wonderful, it's universal, it could be two men, it could be two women, it could be a, a man and a woman, and I loved it, and are you gay? <laughs> and I, it, I, I took a beat, and I thought to myself, I have to be true to my writing. I am the actress. Mm -hmm. I am the writer, and I'm the director and the producer. So I couldn't, I couldn't, I had to say the truth. And I said, yes, I am. Voila, I came out. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about live from the stage. Live yeah. from the stage, right there, it happened. Um, yeah, it happened right there. At wow. the Hudson Theater, yes, right after the show. It was very interesting. The Hudson, he asked I'm me, yeah, the yeah, the okay. Hudson Theater, yeah. It was very interesting that he asked me that because I was not expecting that. People usually back then, they didn't ask you these things. You yeah. Know? Um, but I just had to stand by my, my writing and I had to be true and that's how I came out. Wow, that is truly amazing. Mm -hmm. It also um, goes with this play that, that we're talking about that you, that you currently have yes. uh, about uh, Ms. Acosta, who was a writer, Mercedes de Acosta, yes. Mercedes de Acosta mm -hmm. and how, well, she was queer, she was lesbiana, she had you know, she was very brave, is what she was, because even though she was a, a New York socialite, even though she had a lot of connections, she was really out. Mm. And she dressed in tailored suits. Wow. And she was very elegant, uh, she spoke many different languages, and I felt that she was like a beacon. Mm. And all these other women that were in the closet would approach her because she was out. Mm. But to be out in the 1930s must have been incredible. 
and very risky. Uh, so I really, you know, I, I, it inspired me to write the play because of what she was able to do. So she had all these relationships mm -hmm. with many different women, but she was very discreet. And that's how she kept her relationship because that was the code back then. You had discretion. to be discreet. Discretion, yeah. yes. And that's how she was able to have, you know, a Greta Garbo relationship for like 29 years, on and off for 29 years. Wow. But when she got ill and uh, she had a brain tumor, she had surgery, you know, she just had to sell everything to be able to pay for the surgeries. She decided to write this, this autobiography, how Memoirs. was. Mm. And when she did that, everybody left. Everybody abandoned her, all her friends, because she wasn't supposed to mention their name, and she did. Wow. And one of the people that left her was, of course, Greta Garbo. The only person that really stood by her was Marlena Dietrich. Uh -huh. And now, what's so fascinating about Mercedes de Costa? I'm going to tell you. She had a vision. She was very futuristic. She said things like, uh, this is in 1950, she was saying this. Wow. She, she would say things like, I won't live to see it, but there will come a time when two women will be free to love each other. Wow. And that's in 1950s. Come on. I mean, you, you have to tip your hat to her. And, uh, and she was just very, uh, very brave, you know, she stood her ground. Well, the Hollywood Quarter Press is saying that comparing your acting chops to that of Edward G. Robinson. I know. That is, <laughs> you, know. you truly have elevated that character to that, to be compared to such a legendary actor. Yes. And um, how does that make you feel? I was thrilled that someone can see that, you know, because when you're on stage, you're just being the character, right? The, the vision of the character, and you, you trust your instincts, and you have worked so hard to achieve that, that when you get a feedback, it's, it makes it all worth, you know, it makes it like, oh, right, he saw the work, and he acknowledged the work that I did, so it was, it was wonderful. It was one of the best reviews that I've ever received. Wow. So stage really Raw, also. I'm going to read it directly from oh, Stage, stage Raw. Raw. Okay, it that says, just came out today. <laughs> <laughs> Nadine's portrayal of De Acosta is done honestly and with the utmost amount of passion that is seen not only through her love for Garbo, mm. also her love for writing and wanting to be the best at her craft. And that is so true. You know, I told you this <laughs> a couple weeks ago when you were in rehearsal. You know, you, you were having those pre-opening jitters oh, yeah, and everything. Yeah, yeah. I said, well, at least you're going to do something fantastic, something fabulous, because you always do. Oh, and that yeah, is, so, I, I love that they, they um, acknowledge that, that like Acosta, you're doing the best at your craft. Yes, I, I always try to aim. Well, I, you know, I believe that uh, the work is never done. Mm. The writing is never done. Oh, because right. you're never done. <laughs> yeah. And a writer, it's almost like, you know, you're always a, a, a work in progress, and mm -hmm. so, but you're always trying to get it better and mm -hmm. make it better and make it more insightful and make it more entertaining and make it more educational. And so that's what I've been doing. That's what I do with my clients. And most definitely, you have done that. And so, again, we want to remind you, you can get your tickets at Matcha Theater. MachaTheater.org. And you can actually also go to MachaTheater.org and stream some of my plays. Wow. Um, which is kind of cool. You can stream Skin of Honey, which is a beautiful play, and Frida's Stroke of Passion. But of course, there's nothing like live theater. So yeah. come see Garbo's Cuban Lower. You're going to love it. Yeah. You're going to fall all over. You're going to fall in love again, all yes. over again. Beautiful. <laughs> so tell me, um, it's been playing for two weekends. Yes. And it's playing for two more. No, weekends. no, we just opened. We just opened this weekend. Okay, this weekend. And we have two more weekends. Two more weekends. So there's shows this coming weekend. Yes. What dates? Uh, the 18th and the 19th and the 24th and the 25th of February. So, let's dive into the story, and your inspiration <laughs> behind it. You know, this is what I really want to highlight: is the artistas in our community. How did you? What inspired you for this particular story? What, what did you pull from inside of you? You know, if there's a young writer out there who's trying Gosh. to pull something out of something out of themselves, because you know, <laughs> I've seen the set, I've seen the stills, the, the photographs, everything looks so beautiful, and, and you're known for that, for creating such beautiful worlds that we go into. Um, what inspired you in particular for this story? 
Well, I, I, I was inspired by Mercedes Carcosa's life and what she was able to accomplish, even though she is not very well known. She's kind of like in the shadows of all these wonderful celebrities that she was connected to. Um, but the thing about Mercedes de Acosta is that she is not only uh, Cuban-American, but she was also a Pisces. I'm a Pisces, too. Uh -huh. uh, she's a writer. I'm a writer, too. She's an out lesbian. I'm an out lesbian as well. So, and then she was the lover of Greta Garbo, which was, to me, you know, so iconic. Um, so I was inspired by her bravery and by the words that she said, you know, about her futuristic vision of women being free to love each other. That, and she said that when she, in 1950. Wow. So I, I found that fascinating. And also, um, you know, I love the period, the golden age of Hollywood. You know, people knew how to dress yeah. back then. <laughs> The makeup, the hair, the, 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 the everything matched, the hats, the gloves, the, it was just so beautiful and elegant. And I wanted to live that world, I wanted to, I, I escaped into the world. Mm -hmm. Because the first time I did this play was in 2001. And it was right before 9-11. 9-11 mm -hmm. happened September, 15, September 11th, mm -hmm. and we opened September 15. Wow. And uh, people were saying, oh, we should not open, people were so scared back then, they're going to bomb the theater. And I thought to myself, they're not going to bomb this little theater, <laughs> you know, I mean, but we can escape from all this craziness that's happening, you know, on television and everything, and escape into the world of Golden Age of Hollywood, which was wonderful, right? Yeah. And that's exactly what we did, and the house was packed. Wonderful. And I'll never forget it, because we, had, we didn't have a preview or anything. Mm -hmm. So opening was like opening, you know, <laughs> open. and it didn't have intermission, and so we started this play that we had been rehearsing, um, and when, when I finished the play, there was no intermission, everybody just stood up and applauded, and it was like the most amazing thing I've ever experienced, you know, so, yeah, I don't I, know if I answered your question. Yeah, you did, <laughs> and I think another interesting aspect about her is such a pioneer saying that she would not live to see it, but that they would come into it and would be able yes, to live. Yes, she was openly. very visionary. And she was also a writer at MGM. Yes, she was a writer at MGM. Um, she had a really good agent, and her agent got her this gig from New York because mm. she knew Paula Negri, and this was a project for Paula Negri called East River. Mm -hmm. And so she was put on as a writer for Paula Negri, and of course she also slept with Paula Negri, mm. of course. Mm. <laughs> I mean, might as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> she also had a very famous saying. She, she would say things like, I could take any woman from any man I mean, that's pretty gutsy, don't you think? It is. It is. <laughs> I, I love it. <laughs> I would say, wow, I love it. I love it. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so she was a writer for MGM. She worked with Urban Fulberg, which was considered the Napoleon, Napoleon of Hollywood. And she really could have done such a humongous thing. But unfortunately, uh, Urban Fulberg died mm -hmm. in 1941. And, w and back then, the way it worked is that if he dies, then all those writers disappear. And then you come, the new guy comes in, and he brings his own writers. Wow. And so she basically, you know, some of her movies that were in the works were supposed to be filmed under Fulbert, never got made because he died. And wow. so then she just moved back to New York and became writing for uh, magazines. Mm -hmm. And then she went to, you know, France and Paris, you know, where the war was happening up, you know, World War II was happening over there. So. It's a very interesting life. She really uh, experienced the Gilded Age. She experienced World War One, World War Two, and then you know she died in 1968, right before a year before Stonewall. Mm. So she also experienced that hippie kind of you know yeah. era. Um, she was in the suffragette movement. I mean, really, she really traveled and experienced a lot of times in history. So I see this. This could be this could be an epic TV series. Oh yeah. You know, what I love about what you do is you give us a, a, a different perspective of the, of the Mujer Latina. Ah, sí. And, you know, we were able, and I'm a gay man, so I love queer history. Yes. I love gay, lesbian, LGBTQ history because it speaks to me directly. And yes, ev yes. every time I see one of your shows, it, I find that... Um, so important because it informs us about us. Yes, it does. Yes, and I think it's beautiful that you're able, like, I didn't know this about 
uh, Miss Acosta until you started telling me about yeah. it. And now I, I just need to know more. <laughs> because she That's was a trail yes That's she was a trailblazer without probably even knowing it or maybe she did because she did make that statement she she was really she was really a trailblazer but she was also very brave and she was very she was a furious lesbian so she was uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but which know, is important to me if you're gonna be a lesbian be a furious yeah, one right <laughs> yeah so you know it's interesting that you asked me how i write things because you know i i've written 10 plays but one of the plays that took me the longest to write mm. was frida's struggle of passion okay and I had a lot of friends come up to me and they would say, why don't you write about Frida Kahlo? Write about Frida Kahlo. And then I would think, but everybody writes about Frida mm -hmm. Kahlo. There's so much work about Frida Kahlo. And I'm the kind of writer that likes to research mm -hmm. and I like to discover something new. So then I started thinking and thinking and I realized that nobody had touched the last week of Frida Kahlo's life. It's kind of like the movie ends and she dies. Mm -hmm. Home she dies. But nobody really knew what happened during that one week. And so I started researching and I got books from different libraries and I read things that probably most people don't even know about. And then I said, ah, now I know what I want to write about. Now, and then that's how Frida came to be. But it took me a long time because I wanted to be true to her pain. Because she had a lot of pain the last week of her life and she struggled a lot with wanting to paint and not being able to paint. And, um, and, and so, the struggle of me trying to show her true pain took me such a long time. It, it almost felt like I was channeling her when I was writing it because I wanted to be true to that. And, um, and I discovered that I really wanted to write about, there was a question about her bisexuality. She was bisexual, mm -hmm. you know, and nobody touches that for some reason. Nobody wants to talk about it, but she was. She had many women and men. And the other thing is that she was very brave as well because she challenged society. Mm -hmm. You know, she dressed differently, she smoked uh, cigarettes, she did things that women back then were not allowed. Mm -hmm. But she didn't care. Yeah. She did it anyway. Yeah. And that is what made her an icon. That uh, bravery, that, that, that saying, uh, I mean, I'm important. I'm mean, <laughs> yeah. I love that. And you know, when you mentioned that, I remember, you know, when, when I saw the show, that I felt like I was in Frida's struggle. Yes. That the frustration as an artist, but not being able to do your craft. Yes. And you did that so well that it even scared me as an artist. Like, oh. what if, what if I couldn't write anymore? What if I couldn't design exactly. anymore? What, what if I couldn't play the piano anymore? What? What would I do? Well, that's what happened to her. I think after, yeah, if you remember, I was in a wheelchair yeah. and they, am they amputated her right leg from the knee mm -hmm. down. And I think that just was a spiral down for her because she couldn't hide that. Mm -hmm. She was very good at hiding things, you mm -hmm. know. She hide her, all her imperfections with makeup and ribbons and flowers and beautiful, you know, Oaxaca dresses and, you know, she looked beautiful. But she really was hiding all these imperfections and she could not hide that. And then the other issue was that when she was not able to hold that little paintbrush to do what she wanted, because she was into detailing when she painted, but she couldn't do that. That must have been so devastating for oh, her. Yeah. And that's why I think that there was a cover-up about her life. Mm. You know, I think she really, I think she committed suicide and then they mm. would just cover it up. But we will never know. We'll never know. <laughs> I just wanted to write about Frida and, and her struggle and her pain and and all her lovers, you know, all her, and her ghost. Yeah. She had, you know, a, a ghost, Leon Trotsky, that mm. kind of like was there with her. Yeah. So. Beautiful work, that one. I, and Thank you. I, I'm so glad that I was able to see that. So, a little bit more about this production. Yes. So, who's in it? Oh my God. Amazing. Lee de Denier plays mm -hmm. Greta Garbo. She was my original Garbo. Okay. She is just beautiful and fabulous, and you must come see her. Then there's Kesia Elwin. She plays Isadora Duncan. Mm. She's like a little fairy that takes me back in time, takes my sisters back in time, which mm. is the character that I play. And then there's Kate Patel. She plays Marlena Dietrich, and we do an amazing tango that you have to come wow. see. <laughs> <laughs> I always like to put music and dancing in my plays. Yes. You know, even, even Frida danced. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in her mind, but yeah. she danced. And then there is um, Maeva uh, Sergic, she is um, Salka Viertel, who was the best friend of Greta Garbo. Mm -hmm. There is Skip People, he plays Tholberg, 
Erwin Goldberg, he plays the editor, and he plays uh, Mr. Ben Stein. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. So there, there are a total of seven characters. Okay. Um, am I, oh, and then there's Bruna, Bruna Bertuzzi, she plays Puppy Kirk. You have a lot of legendary queer gay icon <laughs> moments happening there. I, I can't wait to see it. Um, that sounds amazing. And the set, the set is by Marco de Leon and the uh -huh. lights are by Sammy, Sammy Wayne. And it's beautiful. It's an art deco set. And of course, Danielle is my stage manager and Max is my technical director. He was amazing. You know, you can't do it, you know, without... It's an ensemble work. It truly is a great collaboration. Yeah, it's a co theater is a collaboration. Yes. It really is, yeah. you know. Um, I always say, you know, 50% uh, of directing is casting it right. <laughs> 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 and I have a beautiful cast. I have a beautiful, talented cast. I'm very happy. Very happy. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy for you. It, every time Thank I see you. that set, it's just absolutely stunning yeah. and beautiful. Oh, and I forgot to mention Sage uh, Spini. She is the alternate for Salsa. Okay. So, seven characters, how many actors was that? There are seven actors, but some of them are double up. Like, okay. uh, the actress, Acacia Elwin, plays Isadora and Isabella. Mm -hmm. And then Skip People plays Tholberg, editor, and Mr. Von Stein. Okay. So, there's really more characters, but there's only seven actors. <laughs> Who was your costume designer? Oh, Angela Nicholas. Okay. I saw she got yes. a shout out in... Yes, um, she did. She did an amazing job. In the, amazing the job. Hollywood press. Yes, she yeah. did. She did an amazing job. I, it, it was beautiful. She shout really, out to costume designers. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Angela Nicholas. Yes. She was also my co-director. Okay. Uh, it's so funny because um, she played Garbo twice oh. with me. So she knew the play really well and... But this was a whole entire new experience, you know, because I was rewriting it. <laughs> and I think it's much better now. And it's the reimagined version of Garbo's Cuban Lover. So you have to come see it. So you have to come see it playing at Casa 0101 for two more weekends. And you can get tickets at? Machatheater.org. So um, we want to open it up to maybe if there are any audience questions, any viewer questions. Um, Any questions? Or even people who are present? Raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> your digital hand, isn't it? They, they raise a little hand like this. Uh, yeah, and like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, do We're, you have any more questions, Abel? Um, You know, so what's next? Ah, eso es un secreto. Oh. <laughs> it's, uh, it's in the works. It's, yeah. yeah. And, and when, when can we expect to see that? Okay. But it's in the works. Well, I'm glad to hear that there is something in the works. I'm oh, glad to hear thank you. that this work is up. You know, coming out of the pandemic, oh my gosh. It's, it's theater well, has taken a big hit. Yes, yes, very and much. It's artists like you who are moving and making sure that the art form stays alive. Well, you know, I did The Nun and the Countess in 2021 yes. during the pandemic, mm -hmm. and that was really difficult. It's a beautiful play based on. Una novela, Margarita Gafal de Aluma, called Sor Juana's um, Second Dream. And it's a beautiful play about Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz and her love affair with the Countess. Mm. And it was, I did that in 2021 during the pandemic, and it yeah. was the hardest thing I've ever done because it's a love story, but we were wearing masks and we were standing six feet apart. We couldn't touch each other mm. or anything yeah. until Tech Week. I saw that. Until yeah. Tech Week. Yeah. So imagine all those weeks working and acting and, and rehearsing and, and then not really seeing the, the, the actor's face. It was really difficult. Wow. Yeah, that's... But we survived it, thank God. And we're here. We made it through and we're here. And we have... Uh, and now we have Garbo's Cuban Lover. Garbo's Cuban Lover. <laughs> no masks. No masks. And we don't have masks either. Well, actually, this is a mask. I'm going to take it off when we're done. <laughs> So, Odalis, it's been such a... I think a he has a question. Oh, who... I actually do have a question. Yes. I hate the sound of my own voice, but I'm uh. asking anyway. Uh, I remember earlier you were talking about um, screenwriting. I was wondering if you ever thought about adapting Garbo's Cupid Lover, any of your other plays into film? Oh, yes, yes. Actually, I have a screenplay based on uh, Garbo's Cuban Lover. Yes, and I also have a TV series treatment. They call it the deck. It's, you know, so I pitched it to a few showrunners. We'll see, you know, it's very competitive, yes, it is. <laughs> but I don't give up. 
that's another thing I want to tell you guys. If you really follow your gut feeling and you're passionate about something, don't give up on it. No matter how many doors close on you, there's one door that will open. So or a don't window. give up. Or a window, yes. <laughs> <laughs> you're too funny. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, any other questions? Two questions? You. Oh? One of the viewers said, I love the elaborate set designs for the play. How far ahead of time of the production do you come up with the design? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, this was designed a while back, and then it has been kind of like redesigned, modernized, mm. because we are incorporating digital projections. We have a video clip. So we kind of like repainted the entire set. We lit it differently than it was lit before. Uh, Marco did an amazing um, floor design, Art Deco floor design, that just enhances uh, the whole uh, Art Deco set. So there's projection, there's images. It's just very, it's very beautiful to look at. I've seen pictures. I mean, yeah. I'm in it, so yeah. I can't really see it, but but I've seen some of the pictures, and they're just beautiful. They do look amazing. I'm looking at them from here. They and, uh, and yes. of course I've walked onto the set, and it's just. Beautiful. I remember the first time I saw it, I was like, whoa, you know, the art deco just comes through with yes. all those lines that are just so yeah. gently curved. It's, it's amazing beautiful. what those panels can do. It's yeah. just really, oof. Yeah. And the, then we repainted it. Marco said, no, let's, let's paint it copper, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, he, and we did. And very then, art deco. Yeah, yeah, very art deco. So, and then what he did with the floor, the stage floor is phenomenal. Yes. So, and then of course the lighting comes in and, you know, he did his magic as well. But, gee, I don't know, it takes, I don't know how long it takes. It depends, you know, it depends, uh, I don't know, two, three weeks. I to build say. it up. Yeah. yeah, at least two, three weeks, yeah. And the other question? Uh, what's your favorite part about playing Mercedes? That I get to kiss all of them. Ooh! <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean the, the celebrities, you know, like Greta Garbo <laughs> and Marlena Dietrich. <laughs> Because, you know, when you are Mercedes Acosta, it's not me, you see. It's Mercedes Acosta who's kissing Greta Garbo and Marlena Dietrich and Poppy Kirk. And, you know, it's kind of, uh, it's a magical kind of moment. You transport yourself. And this is a memory play. So I play the old Mercedes, and she is guided back in time through Isadora Duncan. They were very good friends, Isadora Duncan and Mercedes Acosta. And so Isadora appears to her as a spirit and takes her back in time. And so the whole thing is a memory play. It's all in, in Mercedes' um, memory. And then, then all of a sudden she comes back, right, to the present. And, um, and then, you know, we see the reality that she lives in. And it's sad, but at the same time very inspiring because she was so brave. You know, she stood her ground. Mm -hmm. So that's what inspired me about her. She stood her ground. Yes, in 1950s. Are you kidding? Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> She's brave. She. Everybody left her. Nobody wanted to talk to her anymore. Must have been so lonely. Except for Marlena Dietrich. Wow. Yeah. She. She truly said, "I'm here. I'm queer. Get used to it." Yeah. She truly did say <laughs> that. Yeah. yeah, and she and she wrote, you know, she wrote her her, her memoirs, and that was the last book she she wrote. I mean, she that was her last book. Wow. So as a writer, I think she felt that she that, that was her last book and that she really needed to be true, to be true to it. You know, when, when I write my plays, I write them because they're very specific. It's the Latina lesbian experience, whether it's historical or whether it's present or whether it's futuristic, it's the experience, you know, and for me it's very important because there's no venue that does that. Mm -hmm. There's no outlet for that. And that's mm -hmm. how much a theater company was founded, because there was no outlet. There was no way to do this place anywhere. It's not commercial. Yeah. You know? You know, I love that um, here at Casa, we have uh, really celebrated the queer experience. Um, after the last Brown and Now um, workshops, yes. there had been over a, about 100 uh, Latino LGBTQ-themed plays that had been produced here wow. and now you're bringing that also and adding the to the Latina lexicon queer eye. the Latina <laughs> queer eye you, you really really are and I think it's so important because people when they think of Latinos they, you know we always hear how how machismo rules our community yes. and, but it's like um yeah but not any more than any other community and we're still producing work we're still making work right. and you're a testament of that 
of giving that voice to the Latina lesbiana experience, the Latina but lesbiana it history. Been easy, yeah? It hasn't been easy. Yeah? No, I, when I said it, this, nobody wanted to give me a grant. Mm. They were not interested in seeing, you know, the adaptation of, uh, lesbian adaptation of Blood Wedding. Wow. So I put in my own money, you know, and that's how I started. But I believed in it. I, I really believed that this had to be done. And it's kind of like you listen to your inner voice, I guess, mm -hmm. and you trust your gut feeling. And, uh, you know, if, if you succeed, great. If you fail, it's okay, too. Because at you least learn. you have the work there. Yeah. Yeah, and you saw that it was happening. I'll tell you happening. one thing. When mm -hmm. I formed uh, Masha Theater Company, someone that I will never mention who came up to me and said, you know that nobody's going to come see your plays. Mm -hmm. And I said, excuse me? She goes, yeah, nobody, you know, first of all, Latinos don't have any money, so they're not going to be able to pay for the tickets to come see your play. Second, who wants to see a play about, you know, Latino lesbian? I was like, <laughs> I was like in shock. I looked at her and I smiled and I said, I'm going to prove you wrong. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> we have money. How do you think we buy all those tacos? <laughs> Uh, I found out matcha is an acronym. Yes. Tell us what it stands uh -huh. for. Uh, it stands for Mujeres, Women, Advancing Culture, History, and Art. Mujeres, Advancing Culture? Uh, mujeres, yes. Women, Advancing Culture, History, history and, art. and Art. Yes. A lot of my plays are very historical. I love history, oh. and I do a lot of research before I write. Uh, one of the ones that I, oh, Marilyn, My Secret is another play that I did for two years. Mm -hmm. It ran at my theater, my old theater. In and, West Hollywood, right? Yes, in West Hollywood. Mm -hmm. And I was there 11 years until they sold the entire block, the entire corner, but it's okay. Uh, so it was Marilyn, My Secret, and she is the sex goddess, right? And she's supposed to be heterosexual, but she wasn't. She was bisexual. Mm -hmm. And so I explore her love affairs with you know, her bisexuality, and also a love affair with John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, not John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a whole beautiful play, you know, about Marilyn Monroe. It's called Marilyn, My Secret. I love that you just dive into that and, and you say, um, you know, what other people just aren't, don't talk about because they don't find it interesting, but there's always somebody that does. There's a whole... Uh, people who want to hear these stories and it's obvious when you come mm -hmm. to one of her shows because the houses are full yes. and people want to this people want to experience history yes. and a history that has been shut out a history that has yeah. not been talked about yeah my yeah. plays tend to be a bit cutting edge i guess not your mainstream kind yeah. of plays but that's what i like about them yeah. that's why i do them Mujeres Advancing Culture, History, and Art. See, matcha. That is amazing, matcha. <laughs> <laughs> not the matcha yeah. tea. Not the matcha tea, <laughs> no. or, or soy matcha. <laughs> no, it's the acronym for Mujeres yeah. Advancing Culture, History, and Art. Yes. Love that. Thank you for bringing that up, Daniel, because I didn't know that. Gracias, gracias yeah. por decir, por preguntar. And do you have any questions, Max? <laughs> You know, this is, um, I'm, I'm, again, I'm so happy that you're our first guest on From the Stage. I know, I'm so honored that we, you picked me. Yes, of course, oh because gosh. the show is playing here, and, and when we talked to her, it's like... This is historical. Yes, yes. We're advancing uh, history and art. Yeah. yeah. And um, it, it was a given that, because you were one that person that I had slated that, well, we, we have to interview you, but now that your show is up... And we had this opportunity to launch this, and we're live launching it on a live platform um, because we want you all to feel that you're a part of this. You, um, if you want an artist that you know about, whether they are a theater artist, a painter, a filmmaker, but and they're Latino, Latina, Latinx, and you want to know more about that artist, we're going to try to get them on here. Right on. Yes, because please. Because important work happens here in this building. Important work happens on this stage. And this is the proof right here. I always, whenever I'm involved in a production here on the first day during the company meeting, I tell everyone in the room, we're all walking onto a stage 
where legacies have walked through. Yes. And it truly is that because the legacy that is here now in this building that these walls hold is a legacy of history. And yes. you've added to that. Thank and you. And I am so grateful for that. And it makes me very excited to know that your work is here. Yes, no, I'm very excited to be here. But, you know, I always think that the theater is the temple mm -hmm. where we worship. You know, it's a, it's, it's a temple where we create and we worship these characters and these stories. And they come alive and we create this magical world. And it's all for you, by the way. Mm -hmm. We do it all for you. For so the that audience. they learn, so that people learn yes. what we have as writers in our head, yes. in our hearts, what we discover. Yes. Because that is how history is passed, right? Exactly. Is by telling the story. So come it's to the temple at Casa 0101 yes. there and be enlightened yes. and educated and entertained. Yes. In a tradition that has been around for 2,500 years. That's right. Theater. Yes. Yeah. And we're a part of it. And when you come and you walk in through those doors, you're a part of it too. Feel the yeah. energy. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Un abrazo. Oh, gracias. Because okay. it truly is wonderful to know that um, artists, artistas, mujeres lesbianas, latinas, are creating content, are creating work, and we're here to highlight that. And I am so happy to highlight you. Oh, thank you. Because you are a creator. You have created beautiful worlds, you have created beautiful stories, and not just anyone can do that. And we have to highlight the people that do because someone is gonna learn from you. Yes. Someone is gonna see what you're doing and they're gonna be able to glean off of that and also do something great. You know, it's very interesting because, you know, my grandmother, my grandmother inspired me a lot. Uh, she didn't know how to read or write, but she was a storyteller. Mm. And she was fascinating to listen to. So, wow. you know, sometimes it's your family members that are there inspiring you. You don't even know about it until you grow up and you say, hey, you know what? It was my grandma, yeah. my abuela. That's amazing. <laughs> Gracias a todos y a ti. Again, come see uh, Garbo and her Cuban lover playing at Casa 0101 in Boyle Heights, and you can get tickets at machatheater.org. Garbo's Cuban lover. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We'll see you Bye. on the next one from the stage. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>